Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates. The talk for tonight is fraudsters and charlatans. The problem of fake news on the radio. In radio's first decade, 1920 to 1930. Now here, of course, we have Dr. Brinkley, who wasn't a doctor, and he would have played one on TV, except TV hadn't been invented yet. Um, we have Amy Semple McPherson, and we have Emile Coué. And we will talk about all of them imminently. But first, let's have a little quick definition of fake news. My working definition of fake news is quotes that were never really said or were taken out of context in a misleading way, events that never really occurred or were intentionally distorted and exaggerated, and an intentional effort to manipulate the facts in order to mislead the public. Now, it's worth remembering that while today there are a lot of bad actors that are intentionally manipulating us by inflaming, generating outrage, frightening us, early radio did not broadcast much news, okay? So if I were going to do this talk about the news that was on the radio, it would be a short talk and I'd be done now because Early stations, by and large, didn't have a news department. Some of them had an affiliation with a newspaper, and the announcer might read the headlines. But for the most part, the public got their news from magazines and newspapers, and they got their entertainment and their companionship from radio. However, that's Massachusetts for however, however, Radio soon became very influential because it gave newsmakers, including politicians, celebrities, members of the clergy, it gave them an opportunity to give radio talks. And those talks, by and large, were not fact-checked. And we will talk about that. And they were able to reach millions. And as I said, some of those speakers weren't exactly honest. Before we go forward, Let's go back. Let's go here. Before we talk about radio, we need to look at how we got here. And that takes us to, by the way, a wonderful book. And if you haven't read it, you should. It's by Tom Wheeler. It's called Mr. Lincoln's T-Mails, the untold story of how Abraham Lincoln used the telegraph to win the Civil War. And he did. Abraham Lincoln embraced what was then the newest technology, the telegraph. He made friends with the telegraphers. And in exchange for that, because they were so excited to have a president who was their friend, they kind of framed the stories the way he wanted them to, or focused on the priorities that he requested. Now, keep in mind, the telegraph changed people's expectations of when information would be delivered, okay? And it also monetized information. Back in the old days, when did news arrive? Whenever it did. Could be three weeks, could be three days, who knows? But when the telegraph was perfected, suddenly you could get your news and your information the same day. Problem. The telegraph created what communication theorist Harold Innes called a Monopoly of knowledge. Most people didn't know Morse code. There's a lot of folks in the audience that do. But the average person, nope, did not know Morse code. So they were trusting. They were trusting what they saw and what they heard, and they were trusting it to be correct. The problem is with each new technology, there's only a small number of people who really understand how to use it. And that allows them to make the decisions about how it will be used. So like I said, the telegraph, when it's invented, only a small number of people know the Morse code compared to the general public. And they come to trust the news that the newspapers that they like receive. There's no fact checking back then. People just accept what they read 
and pretty soon they're going to accept what they hear. Meanwhile, certain famous people, including politicians, see the benefit of the telegraph. And like I said, Lincoln was one of the earliest to use it and put it to his advantage. But lots of people benefited from the telegraph. If you were a sports fan, oh, you were in heaven. Because now for the first time, you could find out how your team was doing the same day. This was wonderful for the newspapers. But don't know what's your point. My point is expectations are changing. Suddenly, because of the telegraph, people are expecting to get the news and get the information the same day. When radio comes along, they're going to expect to get it even faster. In the 1920s, the telegraph is still being used for coverage of current events, especially in places where telephone service is unavailable or really expensive. But even after radio comes onto the scene, newspapers and magazines are going to rely on the telegraphers to send back reports. And some of you are well aware that even into the 30s, they were recreating baseball games from reports that they received by telegraph. Now, a lot of reporters would go on the road to cover a story and they'd bring with them their favorite telegrapher. Here we have a 1910 picture, I love it, from the polo grounds. And look at all the telegraphers and all the reporters and they're all sitting in the stands waiting for something to happen. Problem. Even though telegraphers worked hard sent that Morse code right to the newspaper. If they didn't know someone's name or if they didn't understand how to spell it, they guessed. And if any of you have ever done baseball research or sports research in general, I write for SABER, the Society for American Baseball Research. If you've ever looked at the box scores from the old days when they were getting the box scores by telegraph, OMG, you'd get the same player's name spelled 20 different ways. And in some cases, it was like a completely different name, okay? There was a player named George Settles, and for some reason, the telegraphers spelled him George Sellers. Uh, it was really a problem, because for future researchers, we're like, this thing is spelled seven different ways. How do I know which person? But here again, nobody asked. There was no easy way to fact check mistakes. And in an era when the public was far less skeptical, it became real easy in the radio era for people who were doing it intentionally to really mess with us. Back then, they're not doing it intentionally. They're just making human mistakes. But we're going to come into an era when people are going to give misinformation intentionally. Back then, how'd you get information? You went to the event. Here we have a lovely photo from 1911. They're all standing out there waiting for the World Series, waiting for the scores on the electronic scoreboard, standing out there hoping that somebody will come out and tell them what to, you know, what the story is. And all the newspapers had a guy with a megaphone who was jokingly called Megaphone Man. And he would come out and give you the reports right from the telegraph. What if you couldn't go to the office of your favorite newspaper and stand outside? Well, you waited for the newspaper to come out. But like I said, in the 19 teens, just before radio, expectations are changing. Let's give a little hats off to the amateurs. This is the cover of a magazine from 1920, Radio News. And this is based on reality. Okay, yeah, it's a cover, but it's based on an actual incident. There was a guy named Gustav Werner. He was an amateur. His call letters were 1PH. He came from Lynn, Massachusetts, which is on the North Shore, north of Boston. Okay, and one day he's driving along in his car and he sees a fire. And he leaps out of his car, sets up, and sends back reports to his local newspaper, which was called the Lynn Item, and he sent it back. He sent it to the Lynn Evening News as well, and anybody else that wanted it. 
And pretty much that's how you got news in that pre-radio era. It was really hit or miss. But again, no one had an expectation that it would be any different. And a lot of the amateurs were the de facto news reporters in that era. Now let's go back to 1921 when this picture is taken. Notice the 306-foot antenna. I'm glad you can notice it because a couple of months prior, it fought down go boom. It fought down on train tracks. No one was amused. They put it back up again eventually. I may be wrong about the number of months that it took, but I'm not wrong about the fact that back in those days, you never knew what was going to happen. This is AMRAD, American Radio and Research Company, the home of the first radio station in Massachusetts and one of the first in the United States. Originally known as 1XE, and it was founded by three Tufts College students. Today, it's Tufts University, led by Harold Power, who was class of 1914, an electrical engineer. He was a member of the Tufts Wireless Association, and he really believed in sending voice and music over the wireless. Big fan of wireless telephony and determined to show that it had a future and that you could do something with it. And so he started sending out broadcasts from his home. This is his business later on. But as a high school and then a college student, he's sending them out from home. And so it is one night in 1916 that people in his neighborhood who are expecting Morse code suddenly start hearing a band concert. And then they start hearing country music. And then they start hearing marches and various and sundry other things. The Boston Globe covers it. Ooh, a mysterious concert. And it was mysterious, but it was also historic because Harold Power, the guy that founded AMRAD, back then, he is sending out this concert to an audience of one, a guy by the name of Jack Morgan, who is the son of the fabulously wealthy financier, J. Pierpont Morgan. And he's trying to get the Morgans to invest in this new technology. And he puts out the concert and Morgan hears it and is very impressed and does in fact invest in what becomes the AMRAD station. And now we get dueling narratives. Much more will be said on this subject later this year. Much has already been said about this subject. But once commercial radio began in 1920, you start getting all these narratives about which station was first. Oh, my friends, it was not KDKA. They were a pioneering station. I love them dearly. But here is one of the candidates for first radio station. This is 8MK. And in this picture, we see a broadcast by Howard Trumbo. He owned the record store that gave him the records. And Elton Plant, who's 19 years old at the time and can't believe this is happening. And the engineer, Frank Edwards. They're all over at 8MK later WWJ in Detroit, owned by the Detroit News. And radio is soon going to be described as a marvel, a magical medium. It's mysterious. People can't believe it. But here's something I can't believe. These guys do one of the earliest broadcasts in the United States, and they never publicize it. Nobody at the Detroit News decided that, hey, we should like spread the word. They never did, not outside of Michigan. But meanwhile, here were some people that did. Did you know that KDKA was the pioneer broadcasting station of the world? Ooh, first station in the world? I think not. Like I said, the battle for who's on first and telling the story in a way that is not entirely accurate 
becomes a national pastime at a whole bunch of stations, not just the first three that are saying they did it first. All over the country are stations that are now starting to claim, oh yeah, we were on the air before anyone. And uh, no, they weren't. But publicity is timeless. And an awful lot of stations decided that they would get publicity by telling the story in a way that maybe wasn't accurate, but was certainly exciting. Meanwhile, just like with every new mass medium, you're going to see hopes, dreams, aspirations from some people, but you're also going to see questions, frustrations. Oh my God, this is going to ruin everything. Teachers become very worried when radio comes onto the scene. What are they worried about? Students are going to use radio to cheat on their homework. This cartoon, which was in the Dallas Morning News in April of 1922, was drawn by a student. And yeah, we don't know whether he ever did such a thing, but an awful lot of students started listening to the radio and doing with radio what a lot of students today do with Wikipedia or ChatGPT. Hearing a speaker speak, the speaker's talking about a subject that just happens to be useful for the homework, and boom, passing it in as if it's your homework. So, yep, that was a thing that happened even in 1922. But let's get to one of our first official fraudsters. So, we've already seen some exaggeration, some publicity, some who's on first, now let's get to really fooling people on the radio. Here we have Emil Kue. Emil Kue was one of the many fake experts on early radio. He wasn't a doctor. He was a pharmacist. And he came from Nancy, France, N-A-N-C-Y, about three miles from Paris. And he claimed to have the cure for every disease. And what was his cure? a technique he called auto-suggestion, which was a form of positive thinking. And he recommended chanting, every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. There's an alternate translation, every day, in every way, I'm feeling better and better, either way. And this was supposed to bring about miraculous cures. Now, Kuwe, like P.T. Barnum, was a showman, okay? And he had a stage show that was really impressive. And he would demonstrate his technique. And this was a far less skeptical era, as I said. And there ain't no fact-checking nowhere. Reporters went to his demonstrations. And they just bought it. They just bought whatever he said. When people stood up and yelled, I'm cured! I've chanted and now I'm cured! I, they just wrote it down. It was unbelievable. Nobody considered the possibility, well, a couple of people did, but very few, that maybe the people standing up and claiming to be cured were part of the performance? Maybe they were paid shills? Nah, couldn't be. Well, he was cited in newspapers and on radio as a miracle worker, but he wasn't. He was a very persuasive showman, Many people were fooled by him. Some of his followers brought his technique to radio in the early 1920s, and here's how they did it. In the early 20s, there are very few rules about how you get on the air, okay? Radio is desperate for people to fill up airtime. Very few stations can afford to pay anybody. If they do pay somebody, it's usually the general manager, but they're looking for volunteers. And if you want to give a 15-minute talk and you say that you're an expert, boom, you're on the air. And this enabled a ton of folks with dubious expertise to get on the air and give talks. Kuwait himself did not use radio much. By all accounts, he had a very heavy accent. But he did use it at least once and only under circumstances that he described. And the circumstances were, he had to write the questions, 
And then he would give them to the announcer and then he would answer. He did the same thing with newspaper interviews. He would not be interviewed unless he wrote the questions. Oh, it was a different world. But yeah, in January of 1924, he got on station KSD in St. Louis. And just like I said, he gave the announcer the questions. The announcer read them. End of story after he answered. And of course, he answered that his technique worked for everyone. And when his followers went on the air, they did the same thing. They said, all you got to do is listen to phonograph records of his technique, read his books, and then chant every day in every way. I'm getting better and better, and you'll never get sick. Evidently, the formula had one big flaw. It didn't help to prevent heart disease. Kuwait died from heart disease at his home in France in 1926 at age 69. Perhaps he should have chanted more? Now, here's an example of honest-to-God fake news like you can see today. Or was it? Was Marconi trying to establish communication with the planet Mars? Hmm. In May of 1922, all over the United States, starting with the New York Herald, there was an article that said that Marconi had heard signals from outer space he was convinced they were from Mars, and he was trying to establish radio communication because he believed that radio could reach Mars. Uh, maybe? Except once that made every single newspaper in the United States, Marconi sent a telegram to all the radio magazines saying, uh, I never said that. In the one case, he said, I absolutely said no such thing. And in another case, he said, well, I was talking to a reporter and I was joking about using radio and radio signals could maybe communicate with other planets, but I was only joking. It didn't put anything to rest. For months after that article appeared, thousands and thousands of Marconi fans were firmly convinced that he had some secret plan and that he was working diligently to communicate with Mars. Meanwhile, an inventor and an engineer from Chicago claimed that he could do better than Marconi. He couldn't just communicate with Mars. Who cares about Mars? He could communicate with your dead relatives, assuming you want to communicate with them. He was a guy named Henry Edward Burkett. And he made the claim, oh, I miss fact checking. He made the claim that he had constructed and successfully tested a special radio that could communicate with the spirit world. A lot of people wanted to believe him. The 1920s, the biggest fad in the United States was spiritualism. People were going to seances. People really believed that psychic mediums could talk to your dead relatives. And oh my God, here was a machine that was supposed to be able to talk to your dead relatives. Where do I sign up? Okay. Well, one person who really believed it was this guy, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He absolutely believed it. In fact, in the 1920s, he was very taken with spiritualism, and he used to go to seances, and he was firmly convinced that there were ways that radio could be used and other things to communicate with the dead. This put him at odds with someone I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes, Harry Houdini. Now, he met Houdini in 1920, and they actually admired each other. I mean, Houdini was a famous magician and an illusionist, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, I mean, Sherlock Holmes, come on. They had some wonderful conversations. Problem. Part of the wonderful conversation was Doyle trying to convince Houdini that spiritualism and all of these machines that could talk to your dead relatives and psychic mediums were real. And Houdini was like, I don't think so. But to B 
be polite, he went to a seance with Doyle and was not convinced. As time went on, he tried desperately to convince Doyle that Doyle was being misled, that he was being fooled, that this was trickery, that this was an irrational belief, he said. It just gave people false hope. And worst of all, it monetized people's loneliness. By 1922, Houdini and Doyle were no longer speaking to each other. We know we've got their writings, okay? And part of it was because Sir Arthur was so offended that Houdini refused to see that psychic mediums were real. And meanwhile, no matter what Houdini did, on any radio station in any part of the country, you could hear psychic mediums claiming to talk to the dead and getting on the air making those claims. Now here, of course, is Houdini. And he spent much of the latter part of his life trying desperately to debunk the claims that these fake psychics made and showing that spiritualism was a series of tricks. In fact, he was one of the judges of a competition that Scientific American magazine had. They offered psychics and mediums a chance to win $2,500 a lot of money in 1924, if they could just prove that they really had the gift, uh, the money went unclaimed. Meanwhile, Houdini did go on the radio. We think of him as a magician. We think of him as a performer who did escape artist tricks, but he also was a radio star. He went on the radio as early as November of 1922, trying to debunk psychics and mediums. Unfortunately, all it did was make him enemies because there were true believers. He gave a talk in July of 1924 called A Magician Among the Spirits on WOR in New York, big station, explained in detail why he was opposed to spiritualism, got death threats, got lots of nasty letters from psychic mediums who were cursing him. But he went on trying to show people this was usually done by trick. He had a reputation for exposing the techniques that mediums and mind readers and fortune tellers did. And years later, the heir apparent to his legacy was a guy by the name of James Randi, R-A-N-D-I, the amazing Randi. He just died a couple of years ago. And this is a long-standing tradition of people like Houdini trying desperately to show people that this is a performance and some people just wouldn't buy it. Now, here we have a reverend, a Protestant minister. This is the Reverend Dr. Arthur W. Brooks. And he was a firm believer in astrology. And he gave many radio talks about it. Got in a lot of trouble with the church, by the way. But he believed that Christianity and astrology complemented each other. He said astrology was a useful field, and he said it was a science. And he said that most astrologers were insincere. They were tricksters, but he was not. He was the real thing. He said that people in both the Old and the New Testament, the prophets, the apostles, they'd all used astrology. Boy. Um, it helped them to predict future events and understand God better, he said. He also said that astrology could help us to understand how God works in the universe. He said astrology was just another aspect of Christian mysticism. And he said that when he used astrology to predict the future, he was always right. Never say that. He predicted in 1935 that Hitler would be overthrown and driven from power at the end of the year. Oh, if only. Meanwhile, many scientists, scholars, members of the clergy argued with Brooks, but Brooks was undaunted. He made a name for himself on radio, in print, and in the church, defending astrology. One of his biggest 
detractors was this guy. Now, this is a very young picture of him. It's from when he graduated from Cornell. Dr. Edward Elway Free, who always wrote under the name of E.E. E. Free. What a wonderful name. In 1924, Dr. Free became the editor of Scientific American. Remember, I mentioned that prize that they offered? He was the one that offered it. 2,500 bucks if you can convince a panel of objective judges from all walks of life, but all from science, including Houdini, that they really were psychic. He also debated many of the proponents of psychic phenomena. And he said to Dr. Brooks straight up, he said, you know what, you're entitled to your beliefs, but astrology isn't a religion. It's based on false premises. It's totally unreliable. He said that in a debate and people in the audience threw things at him. So let's go into another aspect of well, less than honesty, but really popular. 1922, a big fad sweeping the country, exercise by radio. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. How do you do exercise by radio? Well, the newspapers collaborated with radio stations. Radio provided the music to do the exercises too. The newspapers provided the steps that you used and the radio stations all had announcers that led you through the morning calisthenics, which were called the daily dozen. In fact, the term doing your daily dozen became the expression for exercising. The daily dozen was 12 exercises developed by football coach Walter Camp. He developed them during the First World War so that the troops would be more fit. They came back home, started doing these 12 really easy exercises, and the next thing you know, we got a fad going on. And radio picks up on it, and pretty soon, everybody's talking about their daily dozen. Now, television hasn't been invented yet. It isn't going to be around for ages. So radio is theater of the imagination. People can imagine all the people all over the United States or England or wherever else doing their daily dozen together. It's so exciting. You know what? I'm firmly convinced that an awful lot of people talked about doing their daily dozen. I'm not real persuaded that they did them. But here's our problem. This is a talk about fraudsters. Hello, meet a fraudster. And by the way, if his relatives are watching, please don't sue me. Um, the truth is, this is a guy by the name of Arthur E. Baird, okay? The E stood for Earl. And he was the host because every single station had somebody hosting the Daily Dozens. And in Boston, Arthur Baird of the Keynes College of Physical Culture. Um, I don't know what made it a college. It, it, it advertises like exercises, games, diets, baths, hydrotherapy. Doesn't sound like a college to me, but he advertised himself as a college professor, okay? And he led the daily dozens, the daily exercises in Boston. And everybody did their exercises in the morning, listening to Arthur Baird and the music, and it was fun. And here's our problem. In Walter Camp's day, the guy that invented them, it was only supposed to make you more physically fit. But as the 1920s progress, people start claiming, as we will see, that if you do your daily dozen, you will not only be healthier, you will avoid getting any diseases. Oh my God, it's every day in every way I'm getting better and better, except you have to jump around. But yeah, Walter Camp is like, I never said it cured diseases, but that is what some of the hosts all around the country were claiming about doing your daily dozen. Well, yeah, I suppose fitness will help you keep from getting certain diseases, but 
the claims that started to get made, uh, not very good. Anyway, why is he up there next to a CBS microphone? There's no CBS in 1922. Well, you're right. This is the second iteration of Arthur E. Baird. Years later, Arthur E. Baird vanishes because the Daily Dozens are a fad and they vanish. And he ends up on the CBS radio network in the 1930s under the name Craig Earl. And he's known on the air as Professor Quiz. And he claims that he is the smartest person out there. He claims that he graduated from Tufts, has a PhD. He knows all kinds of stuff. He's a Phi Beta Kappa. He's an attorney. He's a magi He can speak five languages, by the way. I did the research on this. None of that is true. In fact, I called the Tufts archives. I'm like, did he graduate? No, dropped out after two years. But hey, in radio, you could create a persona. You could be anybody you wanted. And what I find fascinating about that era, nobody fact-checked him. Nobody looked at, oh my God, he says he's a graduate of this school. He says he's a Phi Beta Kappa. He says he's a genius. Nope, people just accepted it. Now, maybe that's because so many showmen had personas and everybody was like, oh, they're just, it's an act. But it led to a lot of people believing stuff that was categorically false. Now, here we have, at age 55, the perfect specimen. This is Bernard McFadden. Real name Bernard. But he changed it to Bernard because he thought it sounded more manly. And he was a manly man, a masculine man. And he was a believer in the Daily Dozen, except he took it one step farther. He was a believer in something called physical culture. He believed in fasting. He believed in strenuous exercising. And he promoted a lifestyle of eating the proper foods, exercising rigorously, never getting a vaccine, and never going to the doctor. In fact, he was hosting one of these morning exercise shows in New York. He had hosted it in Philadelphia first, then he came to New York in 1925, and the medical establishment was just furious with him because he was telling people, you don't need to go to a doctor, you just need diet and exercise and fasting and calisthenics, and you'll be cured of every disease. He was a master of getting publicity, and he always used himself as a role model. It's like, see, look how fit I am. You can be this fit just by doing exercises. Um, he became ill in 1955 with an intestinal blockage. Totally treatable, but he wouldn't go to the doctor. Well, he was going to be right about it. He died being right about it. And he also published a very popular magazine at that time. This is Physical Culture Magazine. Notice, cancer cured by cleansing diet. This is the things he preached on the radio. This is what he taught people. He taught people that you can keep your hair by doing the right exercises. All of you guys that are bald, you just didn't do the right exercises. You want to have an easy maternity? diet, exercise, and fasting. Oh, that'll help. And the cover of his magazine always showed these really young, athletic young women doing exercises. Years on the radio, people listening to this, reading his magazine. You have to wonder how many people really suffered from getting bad advice. But nobody questioned him. And speaking of people that very few people questioned, ah, the famous Dr. John Romulus, later Richard Brinkley, uh, not a doctor, never went to medical school, but he really was a proponent of using radio to make lots of money. He even opened up a radio station, KFKB. And of course, he was famous as the goat gland doctor. He recommended goat gland surgery as a cure for impotence. Oy. But he also had numerous other fake cures. And yet, P. 
People adored him by all accounts. He had the most wonderful manner. People just loved him. And they couldn't believe that he would ever lie to them. And they sent him tons of bucks. The government accused him of fraud, shut down his radio station. He moved to Mexico and put up a radio station called a Border Blaster on the Texas-Mexico border, XCR, continued to mislead people. Eventually, he was finally discredited. He was sued for malpractice. He died penniless, but not before he spent years using radio to fool and mislead people with fake medicines and fake cures. And you know what? We still see that today, don't we? But this was an era when anyone, Professor Quiz, Dr. Brinkley, anyone could claim to be an expert and the public, oh, they wouldn't say it if it weren't true. I just heard it on the radio. And going up against Dr. Brinkley <clears throat> were people like Dr. Morris Fishbein, and he was a real doctor, okay? And he tried desperately to fight against all the fraudsters. He was the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association. He debunked medical myths as much as he could, but it was a losing battle. So many people heard Dr. Brinkley on the radio. Not as many people read the Journal of the American Medical Association, but just like Dr. E.E. E. Free, they had a try. They had to try to make people see. But it wasn't just medicine. It was religion. Amy Semple McPherson, one of the few female evangelists of her day, and this is a time when women generally did not preach. She preached, and she was so convincing that she founded her own church, and she used her performance skills. She was known as Sister Amy, she was a dynamic speaker, and she practiced faith healing. She said that she could heal the sick. Hey, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Just send her money. She'll heal you. And people did send her money, millions of dollars. She was a televangelist before television. She started her own radio station, KFSG, the Four Square Gospel Station. She was controversial. Not everybody did believe her, but on awful lot of people took everything she said seriously. A couple more and then we're done, and I hope I'm not being boring. Let me take you back to 1925. Large crowds came to see hundreds of members, thousands of members of the Ku Klux Klan marching openly down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., August 8th, 1925. People cheered. People were delighted. People were impressed. The 1920s was a very good time for the Ku Klux Klan. I know we don't want to think about that, but yeah, their membership was going through the roof in places where you wouldn't expect it. And so it was that a Klansman, James Vance, who published the Fellowship Forum newspaper, got permission to put a radio station on the air. Because isn't that what the world needs, a Ku Klux Klan radio station? They got it. WTFF, the Fellowship Forum, went on the air in Washington in the late summer of 1927, broadcast for a few years, as a matter of fact. Now, this is not the first time the Klan are on the air. The Klan are on the air in the South, way back in the 1923, for heaven's sake. In fact, the Klan found very clever ways to get on the air. The Klan in Fort Worth, for example, had the Ku Klux Klan Orchestra. And who doesn't like a Ku Klux Klan Orchestra? And they performed on Fort Worth radio station WBAP through the 19, 1923, 1924. There they were. But truthfully, the Klan were controversial from day one. Some cities liked them, some cities hated them, some cities welcomed them. Hello, we're welcoming them in Washington, D.C. They're banning them in other cities. And by 1924, a 
few Northern politicians were getting on the air to express anti-Klan views. But you know what irritates me, all my brothers and sisters? The Ku Klux Klan was given permission to have a radio station. This guy was not. This is William J. Tompkins, and oh, does this irritate me. William J. Tompkins was a doctor, a real doctor. He graduated from a real honest-to-God medical school. He was a health administrator. He was an advocate for equality. He was a public speaker in Kansas City. He was the publisher of a black newspaper, the Kansas City American. And in late 1929, he prepared an application for a license for a black radio station for the black community in Kansas City. His application, which I have seen, said that it would inform the community, entertain the community, and keep the community aware of what was going on. He submitted it to the Federal Radio Commission in January of 1930, and they turned him down within one month without comment. So, Ku Klux Klan, ah, you could have a station. Successful black business owner, doctor, advocate, nope, you can't have one. Those were the days. Ladies and gentlemen, the early days of radio were kind of like the wild, wild west. There were some wonderful performers. There were some amazing speakers. There were some big names in entertainment. Did you know that Babe Ruth got on the radio? Several times. He talked to the radio audience on a couple of occasions. The fans couldn't believe it. That was the good news. But the airwaves were also home to what Dr. Fishbein, who I just found out is a distant relative of mine. Dr. Fishbein called these people quacks, the fraudsters, the charlatans, the faith healers, the folks authoring magical cures, and the bigots, like the Klansmen who owned a radio station. It was a time when skepticism was in short supply and fact-checking was non-existent. And even your favorite station might give some airtime to someone who was trying to fool you, a purveyor of what we today would call fake news. Thank you. Please like and subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon to get new video updates.